At the end of the day, it's today all about the opportunity. I was fortunate to get that. You have enough women out there who have the capabilities, who have the right degrees, the experience, whatever it needs. But you need to be given the opportunity. My guest this week is a Formula One trailblazer. After growing up in India, she moved to Europe with her family and went on to study law. And it was as a lawyer that she first came into contact with F1. She then went on to become the sport's first female team principal. I'm talking, of course, about Monisha Kaltenborn. Welcome, everybody, to Be On The Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. I'm delighted to have Monisha on the show this week because not only has she had a fascinating and hugely rewarding career in Formula One, she's someone whose time in the sport has very much coincided with mine. I feel like we've lived through many of the same seismic events that have shaped the modern era of the sport. Monisha joined the Fritz Kaiser Group as one of their legal eagles in the late 90s, when Fritz was a shareholder at Sauber and she stayed at the team when he sold his shares. Her star shone bright because she quickly climbed through the ranks of the company, first to CEO and then to team principal. All this at a time when men dominated the upper echelons of the sport. Her determination and resilience were admirable and she never lost her sense of humour. Even when times were tough and life at Sauber was rarely straightforward, she always had a line that was capable of diffusing a situation perfectly. In this chat, we discuss everything from Peter Sauber to Bernie Eccleston and Kimi Raikkonen to Robert Kubica, Checo Perez and Kamui Kobayashi. And she was fascinating about what it was like to be a woman in a position of power within Formula One while also having a husband and children. Monisha is articulate, amusing and, dare I say it, a great listen. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Monisha, it's lovely to have you on the show. Now, we haven't seen you in Formula One since 2017. So how have you been these last few years? Well, I've been very well, actually. I think if I look back that um, I was in Formula One since 1998 until 2017. So pretty much fresh from university. There was not much gap between that and starting working in Formula One. It was a good and necessary break because um, last few years particularly were very tough years. And then, you know, you sometimes um, things just develop in a certain way where you have that, that break and you later on, and I very shortly later on luckily realized that it was very good for me. I had time for so many other things to start with with my family because in all these times with all these turbulences, well, I did have two kids and it was nice to spend some time with them, see how life is at home as well. So it was very good. I can imagine. But have you missed Formula One in any way? Do, do you wake up on a Sunday morning sometimes thinking, oh, I'd quite like to be in a Formula One paddock or have you completely moved on? I do miss Formula One sometimes. And I think that's very normal because if uh, that's pretty much the only thing I have done professionally, and I very much have a passion for the sport. I still think um, it's a great platform. Um, you do miss certain aspects, not everything and not everyone, and particularly not the traveling uh, in these times, especially. But uh, there are definitely aspects and a few people with the people. It's easier to keep in touch, which I did. And there are certain things you miss. But I would not say now that, yes, every Sunday I was there to watch every race. <laughs> do, do you stay in touch with the guys and girls at Sauber? Very few. Let's say some of them, which uh, our ways met again. And I do have three of them uh, in the company here where I am, because they're the ones uh, who I think uh, I could also work with very well before. So and with one or two other ones, too. But no, otherwise, with a couple of them from other teams who sometimes are also no more in those teams. But there is a certain group one is still in touch with. What about Peter Sauber? They are not that much in touch. I think um, he is, uh, you know, he's retreated a little bit himself as well. And he deserves that very much. You know, he's got grandchildren. He enjoys that time now, too, I'm sure. So we we have certain times where we are in touch, like at a birthday or so. But otherwise, there's not much touch. On the subject of 
Peter Sauber. Sauber is now, I think it's 460 something Grand Prix that the team has started. And just tell us a little bit about your experiences with Peter. He was something of a trailblazer, wasn't he? Absolutely. And um, I remember my, my first meeting with Peter in, in 1998. I was still at that time at the Fritz Kaiser Group. Uh, but of course, certain, because Fritz Kaiser was, was a, a partner of, in the team, certain jobs were with Fritz Kaiser, you know, like uh, dealing also with Bernie, um, doing sponsorship contracts, driver contracts and so on, and also the joint venture we had with Petronas. So this is how I actually got into all this. And my first meeting with Peter was, was a very interesting one because we were there. I was with, with Fritz there and there were one or two other people there. And you could just make out that she's not so sure that, you know, will I really understand matters and do I have any knowledge about things? And it, it had a very interesting development because I am the kind of person if I, when I was in my first week there, actually, I got to do an engine contract and I'd never done that before. So I had to understand things, you know, to understand what am I talking about, what is part of it, what not. And then I straight away asked him. And I think that in a way broke the ice because he said, the way I'm taking the approach here, there must be something more to it while I'm doing this. Uh, and that actually opened up a very interesting conversation, which followed then in the next few years. And actually in, in 1999 led to it that uh, he made me the offer when Fritz Kaiser and he uh, ended their cooperation uh, if I want to join the team in the function. So interesting beginning. And, and from then on, I think we had a, a very nice working relationship with a lot of trust, with a lot of mutual respect, a lot of fun as well. I mean, we've had very, very funny instances we, we went through, very tough ones too. And um, I always had his trust. So um, for me, it was never just working like an employee in there because we were always together. We was he, he his his finance uh, officer who he had since very long, and myself. We were like always put into the same boat when there was an issue in the team. And you know, small teams in Formula One always have some issues. <laughs> <laughs> That's just part of it. You know? yeah. um, it's always a challenge, and that made me also learn so much. You know, he always gave me the opportunity to be part of these things, even if there were problems, and to learn. So at the end of it, uh, when 2010 came and he bought the team again back, there was not an angle which I had not seen in all that time. You know, may it be as a small team, a good team, a bad team, a manufacturer held team. I'd gone through the entire loop, which helped a lot. Well, and looking from the outside in, he really empowered you. That's the impression I got anyway. He, he almost sort of talent spotted you quite early on. And I think he had a plan for you from the outset. Do you think that? I wouldn't maybe go that far. I think he, um, it, it's not easy to gain his trust. And I think with the way I was just was, and that's the way I am, he, um, he seemed to like the approach. And we, the whole, the whole relationship developed probably even through all the challenges we faced together, you know, um, maybe whilst it was still the private team, when, for example, the change came in with Red Bull leaving or when the deal was with BMW was struck, we, we were always aligned on things. I very much saw it as, as more than just a job to get the things right the way he wanted them. When 2010 came, um, actually, I, I was never really asked if I want to do that job. You know, it, we were in this together in 2009. We, we managed to get then the team to the point and find an agreement with, with BMW. And actually, when all that was done, the evening before the announcement was to take place, he said, yeah, well, then you're going to be doing this. As in doing the CEO job. Exactly. And, uh, and then <laughs> what, I did, like, what did um, you say? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, it wasn't really a question, you know. It was not a not a question which you answer with yes or no. You didn't have that option. It was in his way saying, well, you know, who else you're going to do this? Because I think if you were to think about it, you know, with with half a brain, you would think you're at the outset of a new season. You don't have a car which is ready. You don't really have sponsors. You don't have much time because it's going to be January very soon, and you still want to go in the season. And if you had time to think about it, I don't think the answer would be yes. <laughs> 
All part of the plan. All part of the plan. Look, Monisha, can I take you back? Because you've alluded to the fact that you're a lawyer by trade. Is that a good preparation for a career in Formula One? Well, you know, I, I could take a couple of names now who also have that kind of a training. Maybe Luca di Montezemolo, maybe uh, Max Mosley. Adam Parr, by the way, also was a lawyer by, by training. Mm. And um, True. I think uh, that kind of an education gives you the ability to enter into new areas, ask the right questions to try to get a grip on matters. So I think it's very helpful. I do sense and I had that impression whilst I was in Formula One that for many people this was like uh, something very negative if you had any kind of an, uh, that kind of an educational background. But the fact is that in, in the Formula One times which I have seen it's very helpful if you if you have that kind of uh, an background you can lead your company in a different way because the teams were not just you know little groups of people we were we were companies we are companies and you have to know how to lead your company not just through the sporting aspect but also commercial aspects you say that you think people were a bit disparaging towards you because you had that legal background yes because i think they just couldn't understand the idea that you can have higher education and actually still be passionate about motorsport that's an interesting question because, I mean, how, how did a, a girl born in India near Delhi who then became a lawyer end up in Formula One? Was motorsport a passion in your family or did the motorsport passion come latterly? It was not a passion in the family. Um, my family did have a, uh, a business uh, interest in certain automotive activities in India and joint ventures with a, a uh, Japanese company, an Indian company, but that really didn't have any effect on me because I grew up in Vienna. And at that time, you know, Formula One was, was very much a topic in the news because you had drivers like Gerhard Berger. There was so much of coverage given to Formula One. So you really grew up with that and you knew what's going on. When I joined the Fritz Kaiser Group, it was just one of my projects, but that's where it started because the insight I got into the sport, I for the first time realized there is so much more to it than what you just see on TV and so many interesting aspects. And this is where out of an interest, actually the passion started to grow. And, and when you then get so strongly and heavily involved in a Formula One team and its operations, if you have that interest already, you grow such a tremendous passion, which later then also allows you to face all these challenges. And so you became a racer. What kind of a boss were you? <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I think I'd say I was, um, and I still am actually, um, very transparent in my ways. And uh, I listen to people and fair, but very consistent in my approach. How did you find dealing with drivers? I actually got along very well with most of the drivers. We've had, in all these years, we had very interesting drivers. We had uh, the ones which we got into Formula One. Um, we had others who were already a bit older, who maybe also ended their career. And sometimes when you, when you heard of them before, you know, and you thought they could be very difficult, actually, then you saw they, they are maybe not like that. Like if you look at Jacques Villeneuve, for example, I got along very well with him. You know, no matter what one heard before. And of course, with the young ones, it was uh, very interesting to see how they tackle matters, how they grow. And uh, we had a couple of them we got into the sport. Now, of course, Kimi Raikkonen probably being the most famous of those. Is he the best driver you've worked with? Well, he is definitely the, the most successful. That's, yeah. that's clear. And, and very interesting how, of course, we had our negotiations with him because it was, uh, you must remember, be remembering them, the Robertsons. Who came across of with yes. him? Yes, St Steve and Dave. Yeah. Yes, and uh, you know the the I always said Daddy Robertson was a very interesting guy, very interesting, and you know the way he he sold the whole thing to Peter, and you could imagine they are such different personalities. And I was in that meeting as well, and I remember um, when and Peter he he never used to like to speak in English to them. He could have done it very much, but he never liked to do it. So I had to translate there. And I do remember instances where I didn't translate what he said. And then he tells me, 
But I didn't say that. And I said, I know, but I won't translate that. Uh, so it, it used to be <laughs> very interesting talks we had and, and very interesting meetings with them. Um, but, you know, equally to how, how Robert Kubica, for example, also came in under the BMW Times. Or more recently, mm. we had Sergio, who has now made a great step to Red Bull. So, yeah, very interesting. Taking you back to Kimi momentarily, what did you think of the plan to get a guy who I think had just been racing in Formula Renault to promote him to Formula One? Did you think it was a barking mad idea or, or were, were the Robertsons so convincing that you thought, yeah, let's roll with it? Robertsons were very convincing to start with. For me, there was, uh, maybe it's, it's got to do with the age I was in at that time. I was much younger then. You don't think there are any taboos. You know, why shouldn't you do this? If you're convinced of it and you think it is right and it could be a fantastic idea, you go for it. And then, of course, we sensed very quickly that there was some kind of resistance in wanting to give him the license to race at that time. And that was not easy to convince then the FIA to actually get that step done. But it, it, it just sounded all right, you know. It, it, it said, this guy is there, the person behind him or in front of him is very convincing about this, so we should go and take the step. Were you having to deal with Max Mosley personally on that subject? No, um, actually it wasn't even at, at Sauber we dealt personally there. I would say we got uh, some help from people from a team which is not too far from us in Switzerland. I will not take the name, but it was not too far. Before we delve further into my chat with Monisha, I've got a special offer from our friends over at Charles Turret, which you're going to want to stick around for. Because I don't know about you, but during the Formula One off-season, I got far too comfortable in mid-joggers. And I'm betting a few of you have done the same during lockdown. Come on, admit it. We've all done the classic shirt or smart top and then joggers on the bottom while on a Zoom call, haven't we? But there's no hiding for me now down at the racetrack. And Charles Tirrett have helped me sharpen up my wardrobe and get ready for the new F1 season. They've got a huge range of high quality smart and casual wear. Perfect if you're heading back to the office or nipping down the pub or both. Actually, I've got two favourite items in their current collection. One being their sky blue textured natural stretch shirt because it's so comfortable for everyday workwear like in the press conference room at Grand Prix. But you can dress it up with a suit or something more formal if you need to. And their navy merino zip neck jumper made from 100% merino wool will come in handy because let's face it, it's still a little bit too cold for beer gardens, isn't it? But we're all trying not to admit that. Charles Tirrett is giving you the chance to try Tirrett today. With an introductory offer, our listeners can enjoy shirts from only $24.95 and knitwear from $29.95 with a six month guarantee and free returns. Just use our code GRID24, that's GRID24, at ctshirts.com or in store. You mentioned Kubica as well, which brings us on nicely to the BMW era. How different was life under BMW as opposed to when you guys were an independent team? It was in a way completely different because um, you were embedded in a huge organisation had a very different level of um, controlling, for example, directives you had to adhere to. But at the same time, I have to also very clearly say that the team was given a lot of freedom. We were not always forced to all group structures and group regulations. But all that time gave, of course, the team a great boost. It gave a lot of certainty. Um, mm. And you could feel how we made that step, you know, to the top. And of course, it takes its time. It's not just always about money and, and that kind of uh, security. You, you, you need time to get right to the top. And we were on the right way there. It was very interesting because we got opportunities which we could have never had before. And I till today say that at that time, the team actually made that step or that transformation towards a modern Formula One team. And structures were set up and the whole organization was set up in a way which we also in 2010, when BMW very unexpectedly exit the sport, we benefited from that. Those four years as BMW Sauber were almost the most important four years in the team's history because it set you up, it took you on to the next level 
and you're still sort of riding that wave now. Is that fair? Yes, I, w- I, w- I would say so. I mean, it was uh, very important for the time that t- the Formula One was in at that time. And I, of course, it's mere speculation. I don't know what would have happened if, if we wouldn't have got that kind of a partner given those circumstances, because there were so many manufacturers in the sport. And that is always connected to tremendous leaps, particularly on the financial side, technical side, which again has financial implications. So I think it was just the right time when someone, such a strong partner came in, we could make that step. I mean, there was a huge expansion of the facility itself. You know, in, in that time, the, the space was nearly doubled. And today that's being used too. So it, it put the team on a different level. And without that, it wouldn't be also today there the way it is. Was there ever talk of BMW moving the team away from Hinwil, maybe to Munich or, or somewhere in Germany? No, there was never a talk like that. It was a very conscious decision of the BMW board to keep the team in Switzerland. Um, and I have to always say, well, you can't, you know, pack your wind tunnel in the handbag and take it across the border. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> um, so that was never really an option. I, I yeah. wish they would have stayed longer so that we could have had more synergies you know, between mm. between the, the different entities, which you see like with Mercedes also. You know, if you have such a strong backing and BMW is such a good company in terms of their, their automotive technology and it just ended too early. That was the problem. You said a moment ago that it was a surprise. I mean, how much of a surprise that they withdrew? Uh, it, was, it was a total shock because, uh, and even for most of them at BMW, because uh, there were these talks going on, if you remember at that time, there were, there were certain confrontations with the FIA because um, Max mostly wanted to push the cost cap through at that time mm. with a much lower level. There were the three teams entering or had entered new ones under that regulation. Uh, the team's organization was not really sure. And then actually at that time, we as Sauber were close to even saying, fine, we accept those rules, which would have, of course, led to a lot of confrontation with the other teams. Mm. And that was stopped mm. in the last minute. And we were very, very much on the verge of saying that. And that, of course, in a, at the end of it led to it that if a, if a big company like BMW hears certain threats about um, payments and damages if, if uh, things are not signed in a certain way, they just pull the trigger. And uh, most people did not accept, expect this within the organization. Can you remember where you were, what you were doing when you heard the bad news? Yes, there were two meetings. There was one meeting because every, very regularly, I think it was not every year, but, but um, at that, in that year, uh, the whole matter of the Concord Agreement at that time had to go to the board at BMW because uh, the previous Concord Agreement had already expired long ago and actually teams like the BMW Sauber team and there were one or two other teams, we had been financing ourselves for over a year. So we hadn't been getting FOM money that time. And that's why this whole thing had to go to the board. And it didn't go smooth. It didn't go through the first time because there were questions still, which we thought we could, everything would still get sorted out. And I, at that time, was actually for a few days in Vienna, having taken a few days off, not expecting Holiday? Anything. Holiday? Holiday, Holiday a few days <laughs> with my parents, because we were thinking, all oh, it's going to be fine, everything was being prepared. And then this news came in, which led to it that that evening I took the flight back. <laughs> and, and the next day we, we met and uh, we were told there's going to be an announcement very shortly. So it all happened very quickly, which also meant that we had very less time to think, uh, what can we as a team do? Because our situation was a very odd one. You know, we were just like the team, the product about which a decision was taken. And, and yet we, we then said, we meaning Peter and myself mainly, we said, no, this, this team is not just going to be shut. That's not going to happen. And then we had to sit down and somehow find a way to convince the BMW board to give the whole team a, an opportunity, a chance that we can find someone else. I mean, had you won the world championship in 2008, for example, do you think that the outcome would have been different or do you think BMW would have pulled out come what may? It's very much possible that the outcome could have been different. We were quite successful, but of course, you always want to be on the top because if you are a manufacturer-held company, um, 
most of them at least, I would say, you only look at the first position because everyone else, as, as tough as it sounds, is at the end of the day a loser because only one person wins. There was a clear target in there, a plan in there that we really have to be on the top. They'll be fighting for the top. And then if you have those issues, and then the car also the, uh, in the following year had uh, issues with, if you remember, the curse system, yeah. um, which was, of course, a big blow to the, to the mother company because, after all, automotive technology, such high-end technology is core competence. And then you always have the people in the background who start um, calculating damages for you. What does this mean for the brand? How much could it damage you? And, and it's very difficult to counter argue that stuff. So I think had there been that success, the chances are very high that BMW wouldn't have pulled out. But everything mm -hmm. adding on together like this and the uncertainties of, of the regulatory side of the sport led to this decision. I remember Robert Kubitz is saying that he looks back on 2008 as a huge missed opportunity and that he won the Canadian Grand Prix. And then he said he noticed immediately that the team changed its focus instead of saying, right, let's kick on and try and win this world championship. Everything was then switched to 2009. And Robert said that was such a missed opportunity. I don't know whether you look back at it and feel the same way. I don't think it was that extreme. I think um, one did try to still do something in 2008. But yes, I would agree. It was not like a like a hundred percent target that we should try to go for the championship. That that wasn't the case. It was just quite overly conservative. I think were the words Robert used. But look, so but in a way, Manish, in a way, them pulling out was good for you because suddenly you become CEO and then three years later you become team principal. What was your reaction when Peter Sauber offered you a third of his team? I was very surprised because um, this was never anything we had discussed before and um, I guess he felt he needs to, to have a, a bit more of a binding in the team, not that I had ever said that I'd leave or so. I, would, I did my things always with 100% with commitment. I was very surprised about it. And of course, knowing all the inside of the team, I knew that this is um, a very, very big responsibility. The team under Peter and with that name had a very, uh, a very unique standing in Switzerland. You know, although it was not a national team, it was treated like this. And everything you did and said was always commented by Many, many people, and it was always an issue somewhere. So it was, it was a big responsibility and a lot of pressure when, uh, when one knew that you were sort of getting into these kind of footsteps, which are in Switzerland, he's a very well-known person and big footsteps. And he mm. achieved so much, you know, if, if you look at it today, I don't think anybody again would ever really in Switzerland, given all the circumstances you have not favorable for motorsport, take the risk of setting up such a team. Now, interestingly, you, you say that you thought your commitment to the team was unflinching. But when you had flesh in the game, when you had that shareholding, what did it change in you in, in terms of that commitment and, and the pressure? Uh, not very much, I can tell you that. I have always, from the beginning, as Sauber, um, been part mainly of the, the problems the team faced in trying to solve them. Um, so it was no, no big change. I was equally close to the matches, same information, same insight. Um, yes, maybe the difference was I, I could not call Peter and say, your team is now having this issue. Um, you know, that was then between, between us. Um, not very much changed at that time. What over the years then changed was clearly the target that we have to find a solution for the team and a partner who can take the team into the future. As in uh, a partner, as in a, uh, someone who could invest in the team, almost try and replace BMW, was that? The... Yes, to, to simply have a, a backing which, which, would, which would allow the team to go into the future because it was more and more getting difficult, you know, in the private team setup you have. To, to try even to get to a competitive level. I mean, um, times to get sponsors and big sponsorships are and were at that time very difficult. Now, those times were long gone where, where private teams, small teams could get those huge amounts. The market just didn't allow that. 
and you had to somewhere find an investor who is, is strong enough to finance the team through. And was there any support from the Swiss government or, I don't know, the, the low... No. 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 <laughs> nothing. <laughs> No. Really nothing. Okay. No. What about actually that's an interesting point. What about the disadvantages of being based in Switzerland as a Formula 1 team just in terms of suppliers and getting staff and things like that? But you're not asking that because of Brexit now, are you? That we can <laughs> no. give tips to people. Um <laughs> no, it's um it was uh, I guess a bigger disadvantage and that got got less over the years to come because um, many, many years ago or decades ago, there was not really a motorsport industry here. Not that there's very much there today as well, but um, the suppliers were all abroad. And if you're not in the EU, you know, you have certain um, administrative issues, if I may call them like that, to get uh, materials across the borders. The time frame plays an issue. You know, you always have much bigger ways when parts go out, come in. So, so that already in practical terms is, is an issue when you don't have a supplier network, which is more or less down the road like it is in England. Yeah. You always have to outsource from somewhere else. So what we did there are two things. First of all, you asked your suppliers to grow with you. You know, you, you get them on board and then there, I'm, I think that today even some there who actually started that business of, of doing certain carbon fiber work because of the team. And with the team. So they really go back a long way. That helps. The other thing we did was doing a lot in-house. We used to always be one of the teams which had a lot of capabilities, capacities in-house, born out of necessity. The other difficulty was with the people. Because most of the people, uh, particularly the higher you go up, the engineer's level when you reach, have um, English-speaking origin. And since you don't speak or didn't speak that much uh, English in, in, in Switzerland at that time, it was not so easy to convince people to come here. And particularly if they have families with small kids, that's still a bit of an issue till today, although things are far more international. Um, so it, used, it was not easy to convince people to come here. So, and did you feel that you were having to pay over the odds to get them to come in? The, certainly Ferrari feel that, I think, that to attract talent to Ferrari, they have to pay more than if you're a team based in the UK, for example. No, we, we couldn't and we didn't also pay that much more. Of course, we, we had certain wages which were higher because generally these are higher in Switzerland. You have a bit different setup than you have like in England. So from that perspective, the whole structure of the wages is, is definitely a bit better here. But again, living costs are, are higher here. I think the advantage people uh, saw here was that if they uh, look good with us, uh, they use that as a showcase then to go to other teams. We never had the philosophy to, except under BMW times, to really bind people for extremely long. Um, so we very often experienced that we gave people a chance, they came, they showed their talent, and it's just not them who do it. It's always a team, but of course they were in the front, and then they were unfortunately taken my way by other teams. Such is Formula One, hey? Can we talk about you being the first female team principal in Formula One? How did you find it? Was there any negativity towards you in any way? Um, when I made um, the step, you know, from the CEO to the team principal, as such, it wasn't a very big step because I was already present at the races with Peter. You know, I was representing the team everywhere. So it wasn't that big a difference. And I remember um, when this was announced and uh, that very next race weekend, I, I, I met Martin Whitmarsh. Martin was still at that time there. And for him, it was like, yeah, if Peter doesn't want to do this anymore, well, who else? You're the natural person to do it. So it didn't really seem to surprise people. And uh, because I was for so long already in uh, or part of this establishment or this circle, I never really faced in there any, any negativities. It was more people from the outside who um, often who didn't really know that much about the sport, who then often would say, ah, so you're actually leading the team, you know, as if mm -hmm. I would have some some other function interesting was however that it took over a year till a journalist asked me the first time a question on certain technical aspects of the team until then it always used to be about commercial and other kind of things you know and fia and regulations and whatever 
And he got to hear that actually as the start of the answer, which surprised him a little. But it was interesting to see that that took over a year. Did you feel like a trailblazer or did you feel that what you were doing was important? I think one doesn't feel that oneself, you know, because um, that's what you are doing at that moment. And if you enjoy doing it, which I did, you don't think about these matters. It's only through other people and what other people later on tell you, then you realize that um, I seem to have that effect, you know, on, on others, which is how it should be. You know, if, if, if you start thinking that yourself, then I think um, one could tend to be a bit self-opinionated and one shouldn't be that. You know, it's nice to hear from others when they say they actually saw you there. And then the next thing they should think is that if, if she can do it, I can do it too, if not better. So from, from that perspective, I, I got that feeling from a couple of uh, you know, young girls who saw this development and whatever aspect it involved of, of the sport, I hope it encouraged them to actually go their way. How supportive was Bernie of you? Bernie um, was always supportive of me right from the beginning. And um, I didn't often go to him with issues and he used to always be surprised. I think we were a, a, a big... Um, in a way, a box or a bag where he never knew what's really going on inside here. And how do we always manage it from Switzerland? And somehow or the other, we always get out of issues. But he was always supportive. Um, and particularly, I remember in 2009, when it came down to how we can still secure our, our place within all these Concord talks, um, we had a bit of a difference in opinion. But he, at the end of the day, agreed that, that my view was right. And he's always been supportive. The difference of opinion, was it financial? Of, of course, what else? <laughs> <laughs> How important to Bernie was Sauber and the sort of international flavour that Sauber offered Formula One? You know, I, I don't want to, 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 to put the value of, of my former team down, but um, I think uh, there were no special feelings towards us. I think there were always question marks as to sometimes wondering, you know, why are we doing this? We have so many problems. I do remember him once saying that, why, are, why Peter, why are you getting back into this? So <laughs> I think... What, if, for in 2010? Exactly. In, I think, uh, um, you know, if we were there and we had no issues, this was fine for him. It was nice. He, I mean, he likes Switzerland. He is in Switzerland. But I think if, if we hadn't been there, you know, I, I don't think it would have made much of a difference to him, to be honest. Wow, that's, that's interesting. But I mean, on the, on the subject, I, mean, I think Sauber offers just something different. I think it's a really important piece of added colour to the grid. But look, on the subject of diversity, Claire Williams followed in your footsteps, but she's now gone. Susie Wolfe is doing her thing in Formula E. Has the glass ceiling been broken, in your opinion? It has been broken. And um, you see far more women in, in many different areas in Formula One. Fine, at the moment, there's, there's no uh, woman heading a team. But you see and hear, you know, more and more, more people coming in there. Of course, there's, there's no driver at the moment who is, uh, you know, amongst the, the, the nominated ones in the season uh, as a regular driver. But I do think that opening is, is very much there. I'm very sure that if, if someone is close to taking that step, it will be very much possible again. And if you can offer words of encouragement to young women wanting to get involved in Formula One, what would you say to them in terms of the environment they're going to be walking into? Well, the environment is, um, if you compare it to other areas uh, which are equally male dominated, and there are many more than just motorsport. If you look at the banking sector today, how many women head the world's leading banks? Not that many. In all these areas, you know, I'd say just be prepared that, first of all, if, if you are good, you can manage it. Uh, you will just be criticized much more in a more harsh way. And um, you have to be a lot better than a male colleague to even get close to that recognition. But that criticism you refer to, is that from within Formula One or is that from the media? Um, it's a lot from the media. So within Formula One, do you feel the meritocracy 
is alive and well, or do you think there's more that can be done? There's always more that can be done because if you if you look at the current state and no woman being in a prominent position tells you that a lot more has to be done. But I do think that the opportunities are there. And I just, just hope and wish that since there are no uh, leading women at the moment around, there will be men there who give women the opportunity because it's at the end of the day, it's today all about the opportunity. I was fortunate to get that. You have enough women out there um, who have the capabilities, who have the right degrees, the experience, whatever it needs, but you need to be given the opportunity. And that's something which you cannot force people to do. It's a question of how they think. That's where I hope that there can be a change in thinking that this opening is given. Wise words. Thank you, Monisha. Now, look, we've, look, we've discussed the BMW era. I've, I put the, the idea to you that 2008 was a missed opportunity. But can we now just look at some of your happiest memories with Salvo? When I ask you to pick some of your best memories, what stands out? I think one of my best memories is when we had a podium finish with Kamui in Japan. 2012. Yeah, that was, it was that whole year was a very nice year. I remember it vividly. He was on the podium and the Japanese crowd, normally so reserved and quiet, started chanting. It was an extraordinary atmosphere around the podium, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, that whole weekend was so special because, like you said, the crowd, you know, is is rather silent usually. And and I remember on, if it was a Thursday or Friday, I don't remember, but there was this whole grandstand full of people. And, and Kamui was still in the meeting and it took longer. And it still was full and it's late in the evening and they're all just sitting there, waiting, and no one's talking. You would never imagine this like in Monza or so, would you? Where, yeah. where it's so much of a hustle and a bustle. And they were quietly sitting there. And then he came, and literally he was there for not longer than five minutes. They cheered him, and that was it. But for that, they waited till like late in the night. And then came this moment, you know, that whole race was, was so special because... I don't know how he managed to really defend that position. And I remember the, the last lap or two, I, I had just got my head down. I couldn't look at the screen also. You know, of course, you're following it through your, your, your headphones. And he managed it somehow and he got through it. That's something, you know, that feeling is, is so special if you are in such a country so passionate for this sport, who totally adore that driver. And then you have that, that uh, you know, uh, success and experience there. I think that really stays with you because it, it was such a deep felt emotion. You had two cracking drivers that year, didn't you? Because Checo as well, hit with his two podiums, one in Italy and, and one in Malaysia as well. Yes, yes. And, and the one in Italy, again, very, very emotional. You know, it really also went under your skin, but with a, such a different background as compared to Kamui's now. You know, a, a much more lively whole weekend like that. Again, very, very impressive and it, and it leaves a great impression. So, so they're probably from that year, you know, one of the, the nicest moments. Checo says that his ability to conserve his tyres, he's a, he's a master with tyres, isn't he? And he says he learned that from Kamui. Yes, I remember him saying that, yes. I, I just wonder what Kamui did with that knowledge sometimes. But, uh, but they both... <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know, they both used to in that year um, really start from behind the grid. Mm. And, and because we were, or they were doing better with their tires, we used to make our way ahead. Our starting positions used to usually not be that great. And when mm. we had once great positions, like uh, once in Spa... It was messed up. Frust <laughs> Frustrated <laughs> team say. principal, I can see. <laughs> we, we, we're not going to go into details who did it. But I'm over <laughs> it. I'm over I it. <laughs> <laughs> because the guy who did it got something to hear from me later on. Yeah, I can imagine. Any, any other highlights? There are so many highlights and, and so much which, um, which are so internal because we never really, you know, you, you couldn't really go out with it. I mean, also 
when when the BMW deal was done, for example. It was so relieving and, and at that time such a great opportunity, you know, to, to have this association. And we had some very, very nice moments also with Petronas when they were our joint venture partner until, of course, BMW then, then came in and we had to end that joint venture then. There's so many little things, you know, you have when you're in Malaysia, you get the feeling you're treated like a home team there um, with the warmth one experienced there. And, and there are many little bits and pieces like this, which I which I have very fond memories of. And do you miss walking around the factory and just sort of checking on all the different departments? And there are just so many wheels within a wheel, aren't there? Uh, the Formula One wheel. That do, do you miss all the different elements of a Formula One team? I don't miss them because for me, you know, that was a a part of my life with a journey, a very exciting one, which, which I did. Um, that chapter is closed. But what I'm doing now is for me, uh, in a way, a perfect extension to what I did before. And it's opened up opportunities for me, which I couldn't have had before. The whole world is, 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 is changing so much. So is motorsport. And I always like to call it, we are in a way in a motorsport 4.0. Uh, you know, uh, zone because everything around us is is so much about uh, digitalization. You know, um, and so was motorsport and Formula One moving into that direction. So it's about building up, which we were already doing at that time, intelligent networks. And this is where I am today in. So for me, doing things uh, in virtual racing, the virtual world is actually complementing that what I did before. I'm learning from the the real world. What is to be done, taking all this the next step ahead, and it's just a complementary work to it. Because what we do now, or what I do now, is one of the aspects to it, is to bring motorsport in a, I would say, timely, appropriate, modern way into today's world and the future. Because everything's changed, you know, we've been seeing this in Formula One. To get the audiences back again, you have to have a different kind of engagement with the fan. And I see in my activities today that there are so many people out there who are so passionate about motorsport. You know, people are still totally fascinated about the basics of motorsport, about the speed, about that thrill. And if you can give that feeling to the common man, you're actually just helping him to grow his interest to the real world of motorsport. Monisha, this is racing unleashed, isn't it? In very basic terms, it's simulators and you're allowing, are you creating a championship that people can race each other virtually? What we do is we develop, build and distribute um, racing simulators, at the moment still focused on formula cars. And our mission is to bring this motorsport feeling to the masses to the public. We can adjust our system a lot and we want to set up a championship, but we also just want to open access to the people out there. The underlying thought behind it is that you make use of all this intelligent network. That's why I call it this Motorsport 4.0, what you have out here today, uh, to make use of that data, to bring that feeling across to the common man who cannot afford to sit in a Formula One car, a real one on the track to make use of the tools you know you have today and to allow today's fan to engage in things because i think that's the major difference from years before fans need exciting engagement and that's what we offer have you got collaborations with any formula 1 teams do you plan to do that no we don't have collaborations with formula 1 teams we are open to that we do look at we have been looking at some aspects what we are doing a lot is to have a product which is uh, very flexible. So we um, look at formula cars. We want to offer it as a training tool to teams, not, of course, a driver in the loop simulator. We're a different kind of simulator. But you can still in junior series particularly use it for training because, of course, you can practice certain setups. You can practice certain communication, um, which is important for the young people today because testing is limited. And this mm. is a very important, can be a very important training tool. And then, of course, to offer this uh, very immersive feeling to the public. Very good luck with that. Thank you. You mentioned costs. And just to take it back to real world Formula One, y you always championed a cost cap, didn't you? And I just wondered 
what your reaction was is to the 145 million dollar limit that's being introduced this year how will that affect a team like Sauber? I'm very happy about the development because you know together with my good friend Bob Fernley I think uh, we have always been championing this uh, point since yeah. for so many years and we are we both feel very happy that this has finally been endorsed the financial resources play a very important role in in your competitiveness. They are not the only factor, but an important one. And a smaller team, of course, can can benefit from it a lot because looking at Sauber, we at that time, uh, I can only speak of the time I was there, we had a very high rate when it came to efficiency. We could very quickly adapt matters. We could very quickly move, but we just had, you would say, limited shots to it. You know, we, we couldn't mm. develop endlessly. So I think if you have an efficient organization, you can really get a lot more out of this and um, hopefully take the right decisions because then you can react quickly and, and get the right part on your car, do the right development. That effectiveness is not always there with bigger teams. It sometimes takes longer for them. So I think it, if you have the right setup, it can be a very big benefit for a small team. I guess the smaller teams can make decisions much more straightforward decisions in a way, because that call by you, I think it was 2017, wasn't it? To, to go with Honda engines for 2018. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, that the reason behind your desire to do it? Was it, I guess it was, was it going to be a free engine and it was going to free up finance? Um, no, the, the financial aspect was not at all the driver in this. The reason for it was mainly that uh, I was convinced we need to have a very close cooperation with a car manufacturer. I had actually uh, been in talks with Honda for much longer. Honda took a very, very interesting approach. You know, they they don't immediately engage with you, if I may put it like this. And you really have to be working and working and working on it till you actually start getting into a conversation with them. And I did hear later on that they actually pretty much admired that I didn't give up so easily. And I kept on talking about it <laughs> till they finally spoke to me. The chemistry was just right, you know, it, um, we just saw this great fit in there. And that's where I saw the opportunity, already sensing it under BMW from that experience, you know, I had this knowledge that you can tap on to so many resources, not just financial, also technological, which can give you that extra bit in such a cooperation. So uh, my idea was always that this is not just going to be a supply relationship, we want Actively, people from Honda being placed in Hinville, working with the people together and taking decisions together so that, you know, you, you have the ideal fit. It's, it's a bit like a works team without really being a works team. And of course, in, in time to come, this would have financial effect as well. But we, we would have paid, of course, something for the engine. But there would have been a very intensive cooperation. And this was the driver behind it. And did Honda welcome that driver of, of the, the collaboration, if you like? Yes, absolutely. And uh, we really were progressing very well. I mean, um, we had not, uh, it takes time to have everything formalized to the last detail, but they had already enough trust with the basics in place to go out and make the public announcement. And that tells you how much of trust there was between the parties. And do you believe it would have still been the right thing for Sauber? Now, it's a bit difficult for me to say that because, of course, my insight knowledge ended when I left the team. Mm. But going back to that point, I still think it would have been the right thing. Of course, I don't know what the situation is today, so it's not appropriate to, to make a comment on that. But at that time, yes, from that perspective, I would still stay, do that again. Honda have got their stuff together. They've got their act together, haven't they? That's, that's what you can say even looking from the outside in? Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, we it's absolute speculation to say what would have they done with us. You can't compare a team like Sauber to Red Bull by no means because Red Bull um, has very different possibilities. But I think we also would have done a good job with Honda. I've no doubt. Are we ever going to see you in Formula One again in any capacity, do you think? Well, why not? Let's see. Really? That's, mm. well, we, we'd love to have you back. I mean, do you welcome... Stefano Domenicali being in charge now, for example. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, Stefano and me go back a long way since when I entered Formula One. 
And um, we've um, had equally so many experiences together. I mean, we had such a close cooperation with Ferrari. And even before the BMW times, not just as an engine supplier, but uh, also, uh, you know, doing certain developments for them, which were allowed at that time, just to be clear about that. <laughs> um, so and we had, of course, also the connection through through Petronas, who also did certain developments there. So there are a lot of fond memories. And, you know, when you know someone like this for long and then he was team principal, I was team principal. Those were at least times where you could still, you know, talk to each other about different issues, you know, what you experience, what the other person experiences. So, yes, I'm very happy that he's there. He knows the sport inside out, you know, knows the commercials to it. So um, it's going to be good, I guess. Watch this space. Well, it's been lovely to catch up. Thank you very much for your time. In the immediate future, what's next? Just unleashed any other business opportunities coming your way no i'm very much tied up with uh, unleashed racing unleashed we have big plans in how we want to stream and of course on the technical side because how i treat the the product here is a bit like a formula one car we every year are developing it we have our plans we have our season and I've found also here a niche market where we can use our technologies like with Formula One technologies and apply to different areas, which might not be the obvious ones. So it's a very similar approach I've taken and um, getting people here to Formula One speed. That's important. <laughs> Monisha, thank you very much for your time. It's been great to speak. Thank you, Tom. What a brilliantly inspiring woman she is. It's hard to pick a highlight from that chat because there are so many, but my biggest take homes are these. First, she was one determined woman. Those few people inside the sport who frowned at her legal background when she first joined Sauber could only have been jealous of her and that she might outmaneuver them around the negotiating table. And then of course, there's her journey from a town outside Delhi in India to Vienna and then to the top of the tree at Sauber in Hinville. Peter Sauber clearly saw something in Monisha from day one and he wasn't wrong. While there was some jealousy within Formula One about her education, there was no resentment from within Formula One because of her sex. It all comes down to opportunity, she told us, which in her case was given to her by Peter Sauber. You could argue strongly that Monisha was the catalyst for the increasing opportunities that exist in Formula One today for women and minority groups. That word again, opportunity. She, like everyone else in the sport, can see that more needs to be done, but I hope that everyone listening to Monisha's story, whoever you are, whatever your ambitions, will take inspiration from what she had to say and use it positively in your own lives. Monisha, many thanks for your time. It was great to catch up and good luck with what comes next in the shape of Racing Unleashed. Before we move on, please remember to send in any stories or chance meetings or thoughts that you have about Monisha. And remember, I'll read out the best ones next week. Send them to me at Tom Clarkson F1 or use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which brings me on to what you said about Paddy Lowe after last week's show. Like me, many of you enjoyed hearing from Paddy, and here are a few of the messages. Armando said this, amazing interview, and back in 2016, I got the chance to have a small chat with Paddy during the Mexican Grand Prix. He just encouraged me to pursue my dream of being an aerodynamicist in Formula One. For me, it was just a privilege to talk to Paddy Lowe. Me too, Armando, and what a great anecdote, and I think it speaks volumes of Paddy as well. Nicholas Burnett had this to say, really insightful interview, learned a lot about the man and his skill set, but also how humble he came across. I think he's sorely missed in the paddock, and it would be great to see him back. He's worked with so many great engineers and drivers, let alone teams. Too true, Nicholas, Paddy's been there, done that, but I've got a feeling we're going to hear more from him in the shape of sustainable fuels. So watch this space. And let's go next to 7th Tom M, who said this, Paddy always seemed like an engineering god to me, and hearing him talk was an amazing insight into car development in the 90s. He also seems like such a nice man who I'd love to have a beer with and talk about Formula One too. Well, if you don't bump into Paddy in the pub, 7th Tom, I hope last week's episode gave you some fun F1 chats and insight from Paddy. I could carry on and on, but I'll leave it there. And I'm sorry if I didn't read out your message, but please know that I've read each and every one of them. I love them. 
Well, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Monisha and remember to send in your thoughts and stories on her. And as ever, I'll be back next week with another great guest from the world of Formula One. So see you then. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Until next time, keep it flat out.